After the physician she went to the South Institute for Biological Sciences in Diego, so the former Bahori, where she worked under the Kisua on the embryonic development of vertebrates, which she did very interesting stuff there. Then she returned to Barcelona to San Ramon in 2005, and now there she's a one of those professor aggregator. Okay? It's a permanent staff, but non functionally permanent staff at the University of Barcelona. Her main research interests are in biophysics, in pattern formation still of developing not just animals, animals and plants, so developing organisms, and also some stochastic effects in some degree of Today she will tell us about this long title, the systems biology for the hormonal control of for patterning in plant shoots, but as well she will give us a short overview of other topics of practice. She will be here just today. So if you want to really want to talk with her, just have to talk with her for a few more hours. Thank you very much for the presentation, for inviting me to give this seminar. It's a long time since I was here, so I'm very happy to be here again. And I'm going to present a work we have been doing uh, when I came back from the United States to in Barcelona. And this work has been done in collaboration with experimental group in Barcelona. But first of all, I will try just to s summarize very, very briefly what I'm doing in Barcelona since I came back or oh, part of it. And those aspects that I would like to, um, to focus more on the um, next years. So one of the topics I'm working in is on how cells differentiate in an organism in an organized manner. So this means how they create patterns. In, in this talk, I will talk about this pattern. I don't know why we see it so bad. So well, is that in my computer it's very different from that. But we'll see you later what happens. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, today I will talk about this. This is the pattern that is uh, on the shoot of this plant that is called Arabidopsis thaliana. And our goal is to understand how this pattern is created. We don't know it yet. And what we have started to analyze is how different hormones regulate this pattern. Why hormones? Well, it's because in plants, hormones play a key role and they organize and dictate what the plant, uh, how the plant should behave. So um, in the future, we would like to know how this pattern is related to a stem cell niche a group of cells that are dividing all the times and that are allowing the plant to keep growing during all, her, during all its life. So how the pattern arises from this group of cells and is dictated by the already formed pattern below it. Um, another question we would like to know about this is how the structure of this pattern inside it is created. There are different cells and how uh, they are organized, to the proportions of these cells, how they arise and how they are controlled. On the other hand, we have been working also <coughs> in fine-grained patterns that arise in some biological systems. So for in early stages of neurogenesis, what we find is what is called lateral inhibition. And <coughs> here it's a pattern obtained through numerical simulation, so this is not a biological pattern, as you know really see. So there are some cells, these black cells, that decide to become neurons. And all the surrounding cells, they are not allowed to become neurons as they will come. So this process is what is called lateral inhibition because these cells prevent, this cell prevents all its neighbors to becoming the same type of cell. So we have been focusing on this kind of dynamics and on more details on how Molecularly, this interaction between cells 
uh, participates to create this pattern. Okay. And this is, do is being done in collaboration with Dr. Saul Ares in the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems and Dr. Uh, Jose Frade in the third city in Madrid. And the, the student that is doing all of this work is Paul Formos. So the other <coughs> main research topic in which we are focusing is on noise in transcriptional dynamics. This is just starting at this stage. So my background during my thesis was on noise induced phase transitions. Afterwards, I switched to how a developing organism can create patterns. And now I'm trying to make a little bit emerging of this. Not just because of my background, but because the tools that are becoming available um, allow to do so. So now it's possible to, to measure <coughs> how genes are uh, what is called expressed, are, are participating in a cell, in a single cell over time. So we can measure which are the fluctuations of this expression. And just from theoretical uh, ground, what we are trying to understand is how differentiation, and differentiation means a cell decides to become a different thing of it is, to do different functions, so how this decision is made, and how stochasticity plays a role in this decision, whether it drives or it prevents um, making these decisions. So these are now performed, I do ma two master's students that are called Dalit Frigola and Dalit Palau, and we are being able to integrate this in the future in more real, real biological context. So now let's start really with the topic of my talk. <coughs> has been done <coughs> in collaboration with the laboratory of uh, Dr. Ana Caño Delgado in the Center of Research on Agrigenomics in Barcelona, in the FESIC, and her PhD student, Norma Fabregas, and has been also done in collaboration with Joan Corey at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. So all this work has been published last year in PNIAs. So let's start. Well, first of all, a very, very easy introduction. Why we have worked on Aradiopsis thaliana? So it's the, main, the model organism biologists use to do genetics on plants, to understand how the genetics of plants work. So this is the plant. Why? Well, it's cheap, it's easy to grow, so there are many factors, economical and practical, that take place. So what we are going to study is um, the vascular tissue, how the, vas the vascular tissue arises or where, how it's controlled through by hormones. So this is the plant. Along its shoot, it's, it has um, a, a network of vascular cells that allow the transport of water and nutrients all through the plant. So if we, um, what we will be doing is make a cross section at the bottom of this shoot and analyze how is the pattern there. In this region is where the pattern is already established, where we can see it properly. In um, more upper regions, the pattern, so uh, here in, in the uppermost part, the pattern is forming and we cannot distinguish which cells are becoming one thing or another, just morphologically. So um, we have two types of cells that are vascular cells, ones are called xylem, the other ones are called phloem, and are, they are positioned in a very 
mm. defined way. We will not focus on how we are located, but we will just focus on where this kind of cells arises. So if we make this cross-section on the shoot, what we observe is uh, this kind of pattern with these triangles that we call it vascular bundles. So these cells are all the vascular tube. This is the xylem and here we have the phloem. So in each triangle of here, this is the xylem, the phloem, and here is the procambial cell, that is a group of stem cells that give rise both to the xylem and to the phloem. So we have that the pattern that is here is periodic. And when no, the number of structures we can have can vary from plant to plant, and it's mostly it's five, but it can be up to eight. So, what all this started because my collaborator had some mutants, plants, and chemically treated plants that had fewer and, and plants with less number of bundles and some plants with more number of vascular bundles. And so she was telling me, why? Why there are some plants with more and why there are some plants with less? What, what, they, what is doing this, um, this gene, this hormone that I'm mutating, and the pattern changes so much? So uh, I found that this was interesting as a physicist to, to be answered, because it was like a well, pattern formation problem, and let's see how we can modify this pattern. But despite knowing this, we, we were really stuck on how we can proceed. Because as a physicist, I was thinking, well, we have a pattern formation problem, then I need some kind of transport, kind of communication through space to create a pattern. How can I have this transport? And what we didn't know if this um, hormone that is called racinal steroids and are the plant steroid hormones are very similar to steroids in animals, but these are the ones for plants. So we don't know whether they are able to be transported, if they can diffuse outside cells or not. So this is still not known and it was very difficult to be answered. So we could not proceed on that, uh, on that path. What was also known is that there was another hormone that is called oxin, and oxin is the key hormone of plant development, the one that drives many different processes. And if, if a plant had a mutation of a gene that controls the transport of this hormone, then we had the pattern was taught, well, was quite destroyed, so periodicity was not uh, there anymore. So we start then by studying the uh, hormone oxygen and how this could be participating in creating a pattern. Um, Martha, yeah. uh, for the same plant, the yes. pattern is the same for all branches, or it also changes for different branches? It changes. So. Not, not only in different branches, but along the shoot. If you make cross sections at different heights, it changes a little bit. Because it's, um, so it has to, if you have the shoot, you have a branch, the vasculature that is on this branch has to go to the vasculature on the main shoot. And so when in this point that they are merging, you can have a slightly modified pattern. Yes. It's not very strong the variation, but, but yes, there is. It's not very, totally fixed. Uh, whether the name, the number of bundles is the same in the branches, I really don't know. But in the main shoot, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about it. So it's, it's not a pattern in the sense that it's changing, changing from different plants? And inside the same plant, it's also changing from the uh, from different branches. Well, well yeah, it's okay. what what we will see is that um, one thing is that the number of structures 
is different. And another thing is that the underlying pattern characteristics are different. So we will see that later on. So let's see, this formal option. Well, now you have to imagine that all this is blue. Because it is. <laughs> so this is the cell wall. Cells in plants uh, can have a space in between them that is the cell wall. Of course, it's not this size. I have a, uh, make it much more larger to, for visual purpose. But we have the cytoplasm of cells, the cell wall, and auxin can be in two different forms, a deprotonated form and a, and a protonated form. So depending on the pH that we have in the cell wall, that it's usually five, around 5, and the safe plant, that it's around 7, we have a higher proportion of one form or the other. Why is this important? Well, it's important because <coughs> this form of oxygen can enter into the cell uh, passively through the tissue. <coughs> While this other form of oxygen can just get out from the cell by proteins that allow them to pass. Okay? So these are called efflux carriers. And these ones, these carriers, are the pin, what are called pin form proteins. But this pin protein is the one that when they are mutated, so we will remove some of the protein, we get this kind of pattern. So, just for, yeah, you have to remember this efflux carriers. Okay. So, why do you have uh, only this efflux carrier on one side? Okay, why I have this one is because, and this is my next slide, what you see in plants is that they are polarized. They are located in specific cell membranes of the cell. They are not, so they can be homogeneous and distributed around the cell, but most commonly they are not. So here, these are results from the rich and collaborators in the shoot apical meristem. This means in the most apical part of the shoot. And in green, what we see is these pin proteins. So here is a magnification. What we observe is that they are always on the cell membrane located in this region on um, the left side. Okay, so this is what is called they are polarized. Also in in veins that are being formed, they arise, they become polarized to the basal part, which happens also in the shoot, the shoot of the plant, they are well known to be polarized towards the bottom, so that oxygen flows towards the bottom of the plant. And they are also polarized laterally to allow oxygen to flow from lateral sides to what will become the main vein. Okay? So this will become a um, vascular tissue. So we have that transport is active through carriers. We have that this transport is not um, uh, homogeneously, so it cannot flow in any direction. So it is directed where, when, where the proteins are located, the carriers are located. And what we also find in the shoot apical meristem, well, not us, other groups would have find, is that there are maxima uh, on the shoot apical meristem. In fact, results by Reinhardt uh, and collaborators in 2002, if I'm not wrong, they show that lateral branches and organs form from maxima of oxygen that become localized in specific regions of the meristem. And this maxima, what has been proposed, is that they can arise because the location of carriers. So this is what I try here to simplify. We have a group of cells, we have that getting the hormone into the cell can be it's symmetric on all sides, but getting out from the cell can be non-symmetric. So in this cell, it's favored to get oxygen outside this, in this to this region. That's to get outside this region. Here, it's symmetric, both exit and entrance to the cell. 
And here it's also uh, non symmetric. So what we get here is a maximum of opsin in this region. So if we imagine that there are periodic boundary conditions, the cell has its neighbor with this one, what we will finally get is an accumulation of opsin in this region, just because of the transform, how it's directed. So here it's also what we are plotting. In red, we are plotting the location of the carriers, and in black, the accumulation of oxygen. And if we put that the amount of carriers on each side depends according to this periodic function, what we get is a periodic accumulation of oxygen. What, what determines the, the ratio of carriers that you have there? What determines that, for example, some cells has a larger team function in one side and the other? Is just randomly? We will see that. Okay. Later. <laughs> okay. But we will have to wait for that. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, our hypothesis, having all this knowledge on what is happening on the shoot apical part and how lateral organs are being formed on the most apical part is, well, can it be that there are maxima of oxygen that are dictating where vascular bundles will arise? And so what we look at is first, can we observe oxygen maxima at the location of vascular bundles? And what we do is, yes, we can observe. In blue here, we are showing where oxygen it's accumulated. And so oxygen is being here. In this part, it's accumulated. There are transport proteins of oxygen all around this ring. There are different transport proteins. These pink proteins, I told, there are seven different ones. Some of them, they are located just here. Others are located all around <coughs> this ring. So what happens if we treat the plant and we remove part of these carriers that uh, enable the transport. So we get distorted bundles and oxygen becomes distributed on these distorted parts. What happens if we um, use a mutant of brassinosteroids, steroids, so the plant steroid hormone, that if we get it out, what happens is that we have less bundles. So we have that the bundles still have oxygen. So it seems quite a plausible hypothesis. Then, a uh, further hypothesis we make is, okay, so let's think that oxygen, our oxygen transport is creating periodic maxima that are positioning vascular bundles. <coughs> so, let's make a model on how this could be, mm, how this could be happening. So, we propose which are the dynamics of oxygen inside a cell and oxygen outside the cell. We make the simplification that each cell is just a single point with the difference of that getting towards this side can be different than getting out towards this other side. But entry is always homogeneous. So we can write down a dynamic equation of oxygen inside the cell and oxygen outside the cell. And the only thing we are writing here is that everything, so all the amount of oxygen that is here can either leave to this cell or to this other cell. And in this cell, oxygen can just enter through this space or through this other space. We are not assuming any creation nor degradation of oxygen. And why? So because we don't have any information regarding whether oxygen is created in this tissue we are studying. So, we have this, this is the entrance, this is the exit of oxygen from the cell, and these are the corresponding terms for the uh, cell wall, and then we have diffusion, the cell can diffuse from this region to this other region. We will not focus much on this term, because um, what we can, what is known is that if diffusion increases a lot, then uh, this active transport, it's not important anymore and everything becomes homogeneous. While if diffusion is small enough, active transport is important and if carriers, these elements, are asymmetric, they can create maxima, as I was telling you before. So what happens? 
um, if we introduce an asymmetric positioning of carriers and we don't ask at this moment how. Okay? It just, let's assume there is an asymmetric positioning. Will this create a max maximum? Yes, it will create it. Okay? And we are focusing on just a ring of cells. So it's a one dimensional system with really boundary conditions. And so we have this maxima, and our hypothesis is that on this maxima, a bundle will start to arise. So, what happens if we reduce the amount of carriers? So they still are asymmetrically distributed, but they are much, uh, there, there are many less carriers, and so transport towards the outside of the cell is much, uh, it's too in a lower rate. So what we have, what happens is that the dynamics gets much more slower, and we get more distorted patterns that are just the evolution at more early stages of slight dynamic, uh, slight fluctuations that were on the initial distribution of oxygen. And this resembles the <coughs> destructions, at least at the qualitative level, that we observe through in experiments. So this, this is a shoot of a plant that we have treated with a hormone that prevents a flux transport. And this is a mutant that has two carriers, proteins, pin1 and pin2, mutated. So in both cases, what we observe is that bundles become much more broader albeit some are larger, others are still small, and we cannot distinguish such easily a periodicity as we have for the wild type plant. So what happens if we increase the amount of oxygen, the amount of hormone? So because the, the total amount of hormone we have is conserved, if we increase, we will just have an increase in the, in, in the height of the maximum, but we will still have the same number of maxima because we have introduced by hand where maxima will be located through the carriers. What we will, well, I will not show it, but with a different model, what we observe is that even if we don't introduce by hand where carriers are asymmetric, but this is a self-organized process, we will still have the same uh, behavior. If we increase the amount of oxygen, the pattern will remain the same, at least for the, character, the characteristic length of the pattern. So, what happens in a plant if we increase the amount of oxygen of this plant? And this is this mutant that is called Yaka, which has um, overexpression of the synthesis of hormone oxygen. So, this plant has more oxygen, and we'll, if we study the number of vascular bundles and the number of fetal cells around this ring, what we observe is that it's statistically the same as uh, for the wild type. So we don't observe difference. So this data we're supporting that um, our hypothesis or our model. So what we had also is well, we have this ster plant steroid hormones, and with them we can change quite drastically the amount, uh, the number of bundles. This, at the stage that we started this, this was happening just proposed that has, had not been systematically studied. So what we um, did was look at ver many different mutants and see really whether we could decrease the amount of, um, of bundles and increase the amount of vascular bundles. So just a brief introduction of what rational steroids are doing. What it's known for these hormones is that they regulate cell growth. Okay, cell elongation processes are controlled by these rational steroids. And if rational steroids are reduced, plants become dwarfs. So we will see this in a moment. So this is wild type plant. And this is a plant that has less amount of rational steroids, which is much smaller than the wild type. These are much more extreme phenotypes, in which we are now looking at the plant from the top. It's, it's so teeny that in fact it's just like the rosette and a little bit of shoot. So 
What happens? So if we make a histogram of the number of bundles we obtain for them, we see that if we reduce the amount of brassinol steroids, we have less vascular bundles. What happens if we increase the amount of plant steroids? So if we increase brassinol steroids, both the synthesis or uh, their transaction, what we observe is that we can increase a lot the amount of bundles. So here is the most extreme phenotype in which we have uh, up to 12 or 13 bundles. And through the histogram we see that there is strong difference between the different uh, cases. So, and if we do this not genetically but uh, chemically by treatments with um, brassinolide, that is the most active component of brassinol steroids, and brassinacol, that, um, that it inhibits brassinol steroid signaling, what we get is similar results, less marked but mm, in the same tendency. So we have really that brassinol steroids promote vascular bundle number. So how, in, how can we change the number of bundles of structures in our periodic um, pattern. So we can either change the size of the pattern or change the unit size. So if we have units that are smaller, in the same size we will be able to introduce more units. Or if we have a bigger uh, system, we will be able to fit there more, more units of the same size of the wall type. And What's important is that according to our model, size is measured in terms of number of cells, not in space, because diffusion does not take a living role. What the role, the important role is the asymmetric positioning of carriers. The basic unit for us is just how many cells are from maximum to maximum. So what we did um, what we will see afterwards is what we did was to measure how many cells were per vascular bundle, per unit of the vascular pattern, and which was also the distance between them, whether there was any correlation or not. So, through the, if from simulations of the model we analyze how the number of oxygen maxima depends on the total size of the number of cells we have, what we get is what we will expect, straight line with some dispersion because of we will have to fit a, a discrete number of bundles. In this specific case, what we also get is that um, if we introduce cell division, so if cells start to divide much more slowly than oxygen dynamics, so at every one cell has divided, before it divides again, oxygen has become um, in a more or less a stationary situation, what we get is that the number of bundles depends just on the initial um, number of cells and not on the num final number of cells. So what happens experimentally? If we get all this data from rational steroid mutants and well this is very easy to show here but it has been a lot of work of counting many samples of many different mutants. So what happens? What we observe in black, here is the wild type data. So this is the number of vascular bundles and this is the number of total cells. So wild type data in black. Gain of function mutants are shown in green and loss of function mutants, brassinol steroids, are shown in blue. So these ones have more brassinol steroids. They have they, we already know they have more bundles, but what we see now here is that they have more number of cells. And um, lots of function mutants, so those mutants that have less steroid hormones or less signaling of hormones, they have less bundles and less number of cells, such that they all follow quite a nice straight line. So, uh, what is telling this? is that brassinol steroids are not modifying the characteristic the unit size of the pattern, so the characteristic length of the pattern is more or less the same, while 
they are changing the total amount of cells where the pattern emerges. So if we compare a vascular random number with diameter, what we see is that diameter is more or less the same for the wild type and for, for example, this extreme phenotype, which has twice the same, twice the number of bundles than the wild type, while it has more or less the same diameter. So it's not a matter of distances, but a matter of uh, number of cells. So, okay, we have been saying uh, carriers are asymmetrically localized, but how? How this unit size is decided, and so how become they can become asymmetrically localized? So it has been proposed for the huge apical meristem and the process of lateral branch, uh, lateral organ uh, positioning that. Oxin distribution directs the polarization of the flux carrier. So, since um, many years ago, it was proposed a canalization hypothesis in plants which states that the flux of oxins directs its transport, its direction of transport. Now, it's a slightly been modified or in which oxin distribution, so the amount of oxin that is in a cell and its neighboring cells, dictates how many carriers will be on a cell membrane. So, um, this is a theoretical proposal and has not been proven yet, totally experimentally. So it's known that, um, that, this rate, that the, the polarization, the amount of FOX carriers depends on oxygen distribution, that, that the polarization depends on oxygen distribution is not yet shown experimentally. What, how this is known? So look, see that with this kind of interaction we have a feedback mechanism. So transports are dictating how oxygen becomes distributed and the distribution of oxygen dictates how flux, how carriers are polarized. Um, and this, as we will see, creates a self-organizing mechanism for pattern emergence. So what um, has been proposed by Johnson and collaborators in 2006 is that carriers, they, um, they are recycled from the cell membrane to the, cyto from, to the inner part of the cytoplasm and then they can get out to the cell membrane again. And that these, trans these rates of getting inside and getting towards the cell membrane are not the same. Specifically, recent results show that the end, the going from the cell membrane towards the inside of the cell, it's asymmetric, and this is what controls the asymmetric positioning of carriers. So our proposal would be that the amount of oxygen in this cell will be dictating how the the efflux, the carriers on this side will go towards the inner side, and this is a bit totally a theoretical hypothesis and there's there have been proposals of how this could be performed so how this cell could know the amount of oxygen in these other cells and locate efflux carriers in such a manner so what we get if if we have more oxygen here um, middle amount of oxygen here and little amount of oxygen here, what we have is that in this cell, all efflux will polarize towards the cell that has more amount of oxygen. So, what will happen? Here we have more oxygen, polarization of efflux carriers will be on this side, and so this cell will be sending more oxygen towards this side than towards this side. So this is a positive feedback mechanism of enhancing small um, fluctuations, and they become amplified. Okay. When that happened, I mean, you said that they communicate via the the oxygen, the other oxygen, which is in the intercellular space. So how yes. do they? How does one cell know what the other, the concentration of the other? I mean, it's some sort of. Um, you need some other thing there too. I don't know if I understand. So, 
Can you repeat again? The A1, A, A, AI and AR, A plus one are yes. coupled through the uh, small AI. The, yeah. You had a, a concentration outside there. Mm -hmm. And that's the only coupling between them. And, and the direct coupling is through the carriers. So yeah, this but carrier, in biology, how can that be? We don't know. There have been some proposals, but mm, it's not, it's not, yeah, it, this is a quite a, a tricky part. Well, tricky. And um, how they can be feeling this, uh, I you really don't know. Okay? So, mm, there can be um, so communication between both cells. They can be here. I have not. So the only communication between these two cells is not just this intercellular space. So mm -hmm. they can be signal. no, or, or they can make channels between cells. Okay? So um, I can explain you afterwards which is the mechanism that has been proposed for this. Okay, but it has not been proven. So, in this sense, I say it's a, a theoretical hypothesis. So, um, and, and I would also say it's not a theoretical proposal that we have done, it's, it's that has been done previously for the, the, uh, the emergence of lateral organs in the shoot part. Okay. So, here again, so we have this model, now we have that the carriers, the positioning depends on the amount of oxygen in neighboring cells, but the total amount of carriers we keep it as constant. We can make it that they de it depends also on oxygen, but the results do not change, uh, or the results we are interested in do not change a lot. So here in this movie, if it arises, So in, in red we are showing the carriers and in green we see the, the concentration of oxygen. So if we start with a rather homogeneous um, homogeneous distribution, small differences become amplified and a maximum arises here while there is less concentration on the neighboring cells. Okay, and carriers become spontaneously asymmetrically distributed. But what is the scale of change for E? Because E depends on A. A is changing in time, but E is changing in time. Well, here we have assumed okay, for... So, for this cycling dynamics, we have assumed it is much faster than the dynamics of oxygen. The scale time of this is less than an hour. Okay, so um, here we are considering the quasi-state approximation that this is already in its stationary state. But if you relax this assumption and consider that the dynamics are more similar to the rate of oxygen transport, results do not. Uh, appreciably change. At least the one that I have been showing, all the previous ones occur with this model and they are if this have, if this is relaxed and has dynamics that are slower than this one, but not as slow as for the state approximation, if they still uh, arise the same results. Yes? So now we will look at here we start with a more or less homogeneous thing and it should be more continuous. <laughs> but I don't know. Okay, now. Uh -huh. So maximum star to arise. Okay, so so now we have a full mechanism of how periodic oxygen maxima can arise, a cell phone system. So what happens in this mechanism if we reduce the amount of efflux? What happens again, what we were seeing before is that we have more distorted dynamics and I mentioned you that it, it was a slowing down of the dynamics. So here what I 
show you is this is slowing down. So if we compare um, wild type with uh, reduced efflux amounts, what we have is from the solid lines and from the digital lines to the solid lines. So the pattern becomes more distorted. But if we have all the parameters like the wild type, but we look at the pattern as a lower time scale, what we observe is more or less exactly the same as uh, if we had a reduced level of efflux. So efflux here carries are mainly controlling the timing of the pattern. And our proposal would be that the time point where cells have to decide to become a vascular cell, oxygen distribution has not become so organized in maxima as in the wild type that it's much more distorted and so they uh, differentiate creating these bundles that are more uh, expanded and res less regular. So and if we compare a little bit how plants, these mutants of effort carriers, they behave in the name in with respect to the total number of cells and total number of vascular bundles, what we see is that we get more variety than what we had for brassinosteroids. So, in conclusion, um, what we claim is that toxin polar transport and not its levels are controlling the distribution um, of vascular bundles. And according to our model, we propose that FOX career control the timing of the dynamics and not necessarily the periodicity, but the periodicity is destroyed just because of the timing, becomes slower. Uh, we also propose that resonance steroids modulate, uh, well, our results show that vascular, resonance steroids modulate vascular bundle number, and we propose they do it so by controlling the cell number, the field of the cells where the pattern emerges. And so this, um, proposes a new role for rational steroids that is in cell division, which has not been uh, described yet. There are some results now pointing to this in different contexts, but it has not been underscored on, on shoot um, development. And so now we are wondering how we can control this unit size of the pattern. So um, here we have a characteristic size of characteristic length of the pattern and now we are trying to modify both by theoretical means and experimentally uh, to create patterns with different periods. So I would like to acknowledge the people involved. So Anna, Norma and Joan Corey I have already mentioned. I would like also to acknowledge um, Anna Confraria, Pau Formosa and Anishka Bolivar who have been working on trying to search for how the unit size could be modified and our thanks and support and of course to you for hearing me. Thank you.
from to the inside of the cell. Yes. So it's we will more or less follow it. There are um, weak well the work by Henrik Johnson in Sweden has um, and before with the mayor of the United States, it has modeled both kinds of forms. Okay, but they consider that the amount, uh, the proportions of one and the other, it's preserved over time in the cell wall and in the cytoplasm. And in the end, you can more or less simplify the model to get this. So it's a simplification. But, um, but for the purpose of how to create an axima, uh, I think it's valid enough. In the, in the simulation, you show uh, the cell uh, concentration in this stripe of cells. You mentioned that the profile of uh, MERS is due to the um, some asymmetries in the system, right? How did you model that asymmetries in your, in your equation? How did you put uh, this? Uh, okay, so, so what we know, we start with a more or less homogeneous distribution of oxygen and just consider a small random fluctuation, uh, uniform or gaffin with uh, a very small um, deviation. So but yeah. it's like an initial condition. It's not something that we model the dynamics of fluctuations. We just put an initial condition that it's homogeneous yeah. with a slight variability. And then we'll see what happens. Because if we put the totally homogeneous uh, in pattern will not uh, emerge. I'm a little bit confused about the capital A and the small A. So I understood that the capital were inside the cell and the small A were in the membrane. Yes. So you show me the equations. So I think I mean, this is related to what the rest of told me so, that. so there is influence between inside, not only via the concentration in the membrane, but also directly through the density inside, right, of the neighboring cell. So I have a, a neighboring cell, so the concentration inside matters to me, and also the membrane between us, right, after the equation we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you said that this is not, uh, I mean, that the, that there is not evidence, biological evidence, how this is done. Mm -hmm. It's not the still. No, it has not been proven. Okay. But uh, still, I mean, there is, I mean, you, you cannot get an equation avoiding these uh, this loops. I mean, just using the intermediate one. So capital A influences the small A, and the small A influences capital A. I, I don't think I understand. So these equations are telling you that small a is influencing capital A and vice versa. No, a, capital A and small a are interesting because the membrane around the cell, right? So the membrane affects what is inside because you can feel it through the membrane. No. What is? It's just the amount of of oxygen entering or getting out from yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's because it's yeah. in that. Yes. What is more difficult to understand, at least to me, is that the, what is inside the neighboring, the neighboring cell, that I don't know because there is something in the membrane, is also affecting the other cell. Mm -hmm. This is the part that is... Okay. If so I it seems that if you put that in there, it's because otherwise you are not going to get what you... <laughs> Wow. So I think this is critical, this is my understanding. You are totally right, that if, if you just put a uh, dependence on, so if f groups carriers asymmetry depends just on the amount, so this is one f groups carrier, if it just depends on the amount of oxygen of here and here, you do not get a pattern. Um, a mechanism of pattern formation. Okay, so you have to invoke uh, perhaps indirect mechanisms that here they 
pass information through here, which they will finally give it there. Okay, it's not um, it's not impossible biologically. Okay, but it has not been uh, it has not been shown. So it's not that say no, there's no means it could happen. No, there are, but uh, we have not been able. The community has not been able or has not addressed this issue yet. for me to understand the, the, trees and the, the trees and the forest in your conclusions. Okay. What I mean is, I mean, how, how much of your conclusions are important because they explain what is particularly going on in this particular plant, and how much of that has some universal value for things that you could see happening in other biological systems or other plants. Okay. Uh, Let me put it in a different way. When we were uh, doing uh, pattern formation in physics, I mean, what we were trying to see was universal mechanism or classifications of patterns, and then to see realizations of that in different physical systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We go now. It's a um, realization of a specific system, whether it's universal or not. Mm. So, the mechanism we are proposing or we are dealing with here has been proposed in other contexts of the same plant for other processes, like Philodaxia, which is the positioning of branches and flowers. Uh, you say, for other plants, uh, I really don't know. I think that's my question. I'm learning something about this particular plant, which might be interesting yes, you are a lot, or we are, we are learning something that has more universal value than this. Uh, I hope the answer is we are learning more things as for this <coughs> particular plant, but we don't have uh, experimental evidence enough to say you that. So. Mm, uh, in plants, this is the main plant that is studied. There, there are other studies in trees, and there are other studies in tomatoes. But um, whether so, I think it is. Oxin has been its role has been described in several different plants. Uh, Brassinosteroids steroids has been described in not very different plants but in some so you can expect it will be more or less active but mm, you cannot be sure about it so it's there's no study not about that so then you have a number of questions related to your equations so first then you assume that the total amount of oxygen is conserved, right? I don't agree. Now, you seem to be uh, forgetting that this has a third dimension, so that oxygen is actually coming from the top, mm -hmm. and it's actually this sort of problem. So, it could be that uh, conservation of oxygen is not uh, necessary or not. I mean, mm -hmm. when you, if you put a conservation law there, it, in terms of the sort of instabilities that you can have, you can have radical impact on that, on the sort of instability that you have. And you seem to assume that you do have considerable forcing. And certainly, to me, it's really bad in the So we have, it's true that conservation of oxygen is not it's a condition that uh, marks some of the results, but not all. For instance, conservation of oxygen, it's critical for whether the pattern is being conserved as we have some emissions. But it's not critical for the other elements. So we have modeled uh, with a, this third dimension, let's consider flux uh, from the top to the bottom, where uh, if we change oxygen uh, levels changes, whether it may change the amount of air flux, these changes and these results are preserved. Okay. 
okay? That it's true that it's critical for some aspects. For the ones who have been focusing more, it's not. Mm -hmm. And especially this is the diffusion that we have there. Uh, is it important that we can put it equal to zero? Or, or do you need, need it? Mm -hmm. I'm asking because clearly you don't know what the diffusion is, right? I mean, it's very difficult to measure the diffusion. It, it, it has been measured. Yeah? Yeah. And plants that have been, and some work trying to, to measure it. And what it has been proposed is that it's uh, like 10 times slower than the rate of active transport. So, yeah, you could put it to zero, but, mm -hmm. but well, you know it's, it's there. It's very small, but you can't even compare it. Albeit it's not as small as what it is. Okay, so we thank Mark again.